actually so remarkable how quickly your heart rate goes from zero to 100 when you step up onto the stage. Um, but you guys have been such a welcoming audience for all of our other um, speakers, so I just need to take a deep breath and lean into my speech today or my talk today, which is about effective leadership. And it's really interesting over the course of today that when you've been asked to do something, you have all gone and done it. And as children, we play the game follow the leader, right? Where we copy and we imitate the person that's in front of us. But speaking to the young people within the audience at the moment, you guys probably play follow the leader a little bit less because what you actually do in the context of our current world is follow the influencer, right? And there's no judgment from that for me. I follow influencers as well. But I actually don't mind influencer as another term for leadership. I think it's really interesting when we talk about leadership because we all have so many different definitions of what it means. And what I, or where I draw my definition from is Brene Brown. She is a shame and vulnerability researcher. And she defines leadership as anyone who takes responsibility for finding potential in people or processes and developing that potential. And when Brene Brown did her seven years worth of research into leadership, she asked thousands of people across the world in different locations, different jobs, different demographics, about what made a good leader. And there was thousands upon thousands of answers. And she couldn't really figure out exactly what it was that made a good leader, yet. But when she inverted the question and turned it the other way around and asked what made a bad leader, oh, everybody had lots to say about that. And that's probably our negativity bias playing along, but it's also the thing that we really remember. And what came out of that research was a whole list of things that made a bad leader that lots of people really uh, agreed upon. There was a number one thing that stood amongst the list by itself. And that was that ineffective leaders avoid tough conversations. They don't have the hard conversations. And we've all been in that position, right? Where we've known that we've needed to have a hard conversation and just been like, nah, I'm not doing it. And that discomfort is really hard. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to have that conversation. But it also takes a certain amount of skill. We've all been in this room with somebody who's come up to us and has been like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Don't talk to me, I'm fine. It's like, well, everything about your body language and your tone and expression is telling me you you're not fine. But how do we deal with that, right? There is a strength that we all have. According to the character, uh, the BIA Character Institute, we all have a number of strengths. One of them is social intelligence and it's to varying degrees in all of us. But in order for us to have these hard conversations as effective leaders, we need to have a developing sense of social intelligence. And what we mean by that is, have an ability to sense what other people are feeling, thinking, maybe empathize with them a little, and then use that awareness in our communication, in our exchange with others. So it got me to thinking, when I needed to form a, a research question and I was really intrigued about effective leadership in the current landscape. You know, we've really shifted as a society. We still very much need scientific and tech technological solutions, but what we're also really needing at the moment are social solutions. And people who can solve problems that are inherently social. So we need to have that science. We need to know what to do, how to communicate more effectively and maintain relationships and connections. So if we're saying that an effective 21st century leader needs to have a higher degree of social intelligence, where do our young people spend most of their social time? Online. Right? Again, there's no judgment from me. I spend heaps of time online. I love social media as much as the next person. Young people, adolescents aged between 12 and 19, are spending about 14 and a half hours a week on social media. 
And I actually reckon a few of you might spend more than that. I know that there have been days where I've accidentally fallen into five hours of time on social media in one day. That's only just over two per day. The other thing that makes me think that it's a little bit higher is when I used to work at a residential campus, students came away for eight weeks and they didn't have their devices or phones. And I would often see them sit down and there was a bit of time to spare and reach for their pocket where there was no phone. So young people, and myself, I would consider myself relatively young, are using phones and social media really habitually. It's part of the social ecology now that we actually need to use it. And even professionally, we need to use social media as well. So given that it is such an inherent part of our day-to-day going on, I had a hunch about the hunch, right? I've seen a number of you hunch over through, through speeches today and that, that break that we just had. How can we more effectively use social media to increase our social intelligence? which is something that we need if we wish to be effective leaders in our current landscape. So, before I launch into the answers that I found um, in some of my research, I think it's really important for me to know that truly, if you want to improve your social intelligence, you need to have more face-to-face -face conversations. Full stop. It is the best way to develop this strength that you have because we understand from social development and social cognitive theory that by observing interactions and taking part in face-to-face -face interactions, that's how we build the skill. But if we are using social media to the degree that we are, and it's needed to the degree that it is, how can we use it more effectively? So the idea that I want to leave with you today is how can we more consciously use this thing that we have in order to develop our leadership ability. And it boils down to who, what, and why. So, who? Who are you? And the type of person that you are will really impact the answer to this part of conscious use. If I were to ask you right now to approach three strangers that you've never met and start a conversation with them and engage in conversation with them, you will all place yourself on a spectrum from down this end, or not down, up this end, over this side of, yeah, no problem, I'll go. I was thinking about approaching them anyway. Love a chat with a stranger. And then some of you will actually walk down this end of the spectrum and probably out the door because you'd rather avoid that at all costs. If in this particular scenario you find yourself further to this side of the spectrum, you probably consider yourself fairly confident in social situations. It doesn't scare you. You may have a higher level of social skill, more in your toolbox. And so what the research tells us is that if you're using social media actively, so where you're exchanging with people, your skills will just go from strength to strength to strength. The theory is that the rich get richer. Those that already have that social intelligence will then just develop it even further. If you find yourself kind of moving more towards the middle or to the other side of the spectrum, there's a few things that you should probably consider in your social media use. It's kind of brilliant for you guys because you get to practice using language, responding to people, trying to understand others, what they're saying, the language. Because there's lower emotional risk, right? Like the chance of you embarrassing yourself is so much lower because there's kind of a, 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 quite a visual screen in between you and the other person or other people. So something I wish you to consider is if you're using it really actively and really exploring the language, then that's fantastic. It will or may, I should say, increase your social intelligence. However, if you're online and socialising, that kind of interacting with others is kind of not really your idea of fun, and you go online and that's the only place that you interact with people, my challenge to you is to have a really good think about how many, how much time you're spending interacting with people in that space versus really trying to challenge yourself and move into the real world. Again, the idea that I want to try and bring here today is more conscious use of social media. 
So my first challenge is think about who you are within the context of socialising and perhaps where that plays out when you're interacting with social media. The second thing that you need to consider is what? So what type of social media platforms are you using? Now, I define social media platforms as any online medium that has you exchanging or interacting with another person or group. And, you know, the most popular ones are data is telling us that young people at the moment are using TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook's kind of a big deck for you guys, kind of wasn't really one that you engaged with initially. And there's not for more. Some, but I probably don't even know because I'm not cool enough yet to understand it. But with all of these platforms, they fall into two categories. One of them is asynchronistic and one of them is synchronistic, but it's really simple. Synchronistic means that there's somebody at the other end of your communication and you're bouncing back and forth with them. It's live. So that could be an Instagram live. And people are commenting and you're directly communicating with them. That's synchronistic. And this is the type of platform you want to be engaging with more. Because you get to have that immediacy of communication, you're receiving something from someone, you're thinking about it, and then you're responding almost immediately. So it's the closest type of online platform that replicates face-to-face -face communication. Because think about it, when you're talking to somebody, or you're having this tough conversation in your next, when you're next wanting to show that leadership capacity, it's going to be more likely face-to-face, -face, right? So you don't have time to edit and change and think about your responses. So that's why we want synchronistic use. More so than asynchronistic, which are the ones where it's like you write a comment, you leave it, and then somebody will respond to it at a later date. Think about um, talking on behalf of a friend, sending a text message to someone you can see. Somebody you have a bit of a crush on. Often, again, not necessarily from personal experience, you send it to about 20 people to check, Make sure you edit it, get the words right, so it can have maximum impact. That doesn't happen in face to face. And so what asynchronistic platforms do, where we interact and then the other user interacts at another time, is that we edit and we change. And that's not really replicating what happens in real life. So my second challenge to you in terms of your social media use is have a really critical think about what's your percentage of synchronistic really live, interactive kind of social media platforms that you use versus asynchronistic, which don't have that interaction piece. And then the third is why. Why are you using social media? Now, as a general rule, we use social media and the evidence is outstanding in this space. We use it for connection. We are biologically wired for connection. We're actually it actually used to be survival. We didn't use to survive if we were connected to part of the pack. Right, so we all use it for connection, the evidence is overwhelming. What's really interesting, especially in the last five to ten years, is that there's been another reason that we use it, which isn't outwardly, it isn't about connecting and finding people and your tribe and support, it's very inwardly, right? because we go online and we play the comparison game. Self-worth, self-identity. And again, I'm so guilty of it. The amount of times that I have very absentmindedly picked up my phone and found myself following somebody on Instagram, and then, oh, who's that friend? Tap on that person, go all the way down, and I leave not feeling great, not feeling energized, actually feeling not good enough. <laughs> So my last challenge to all of you is really critically think about why you're using this particular social media platform at this particular time. If it's a time filler, all right, sure. But I'd really ask you chronically, or critically, I should say, think about is it an outwardly reason that you're using social media? In which case, it is more likely that you're going to develop that social intelligence piece? Or is it that it's more inwardly? in which case that development may not occur. If we wish to be effective leaders in the current societal landscape, we must have a 
developing sense of our social intelligence, our ability to read, interact, and respond to others. So, rather than following the influencer, may I suggest that you have a go at trying to be 